Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and Lesson 11 is going to explain the truth about what Jesus thought about interest rates. Now, in 1948, they discovered the Nag Hammadi Scrolls in the Egyptian desert, and in it was the Gospel of Thomas. This was one of the Gospels that had been deleted from the Bible, and in it, Thomas 95, he said, Jesus said, if you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Better you should give it to someone who can't pay you back. So I'm going to explain what Jesus thought about interest rates, and then I'll do about Oh, 600 verses of poetry. That everything in the Bible about interest I found, I put the verse in a poem, and I'll be doing that over the next few episodes. So, this was an article I wrote in Easter of 1998. I called it Jesus Christ's Golden Mules. It's only fitting that I, after Easter Sunday, I take the time to look back on all the different facts I've learned about the life of Jesus Christ and his promise of deliverance from debts in the Lord's Prayer follow the money. I don't know how many cop shows and detective stories where the wise old investigator says follow the money. The majority of the misconceptions about Christ stem from the fact that they've been told he was a poor laborer and itinerant preacher with no resources at his disposal. Though J.C. and his merry band of barter boosters, anti-mammon evangelists, were labeled drunkards and gluttons, these party animals always had enough money for more. The point ignored by most Christians is how the Magi not only dropped a load of frankincense and myrrh on J.C. when he was born, but also left him with a lot of gold in his trust fund. Before they left Bethlehem, this kid wasn't going to need for anything. They didn't say how many of these foreign kings were in the caravan or how much gold they offered, but in the parable of the talents, the master lends his best servant five talents of gold. So might these kings offer homage with ten talents each? At 75 pounds per talent, that's 750 pounds, ten talents of gold. Less than one cubic foot, though. You know, it's heavy stuff gold per talent. So, uh, it's about one little suitcase. More than a ton of gold in three suitcases, though. In those days, interest on trust funds was around 38%. Bad times for the poor, but just like a 25% mutual fund would double your money every three years, 38% made J.C.'s trust funds double every two and a half years. Two doubles in five years, four doubles in ten years. At 2.5 years old, J.C.'s trust fund would have two tons on six mules. And at five years old, he'd have four tons owed in 12 suitcases on 12 mules. And at 10 years old, he'd have 16 tons owed on 48 mules. At 20 years old, he might have come into 256 tons of gold on 768 mules. And if they made him wait until he was 30 years old before getting his hands on his inheritance and starting to make a name for himself, He'd have had a trust fund of over 4,000 tons of gold to work with, 12,000 mules, as rich as any gold mine owner with his 10,000 slaves. That's the magic of compound interest. No wonder he shook up the establishment. So the point we're told that his brilliant mind developed after years of doing carpentry for peasants. Recent writings point out that J.C. and his father Joseph were both tectons at the top of the technology totem poles. They were drawing up the blueprints, not hammering in the nails. The article in the book was called Jesus, Builder and Master by Giovanni Magnani, arguing that Greek scriptures refer to Joseph and Jesus as master builders, tectons, implying a high level of professional training and craftsmanship. Now, I always figured that with all the gold the Magi gave him, he could afford to take systems engineering rather than carpentry. Christ was a tecton with a lot of gold, whose Roman execution order certified him as the king of the Jews. If the scribes weren't joking around with the emperor's paperwork, the Bible may have been even an epic, more epic story if it wasn't some poor carpenter's son taken on the usury establishment, but a bona fide rich crown prince giving up the whole world. If I were a Hollywood scriptwriter, I think that his turning out to be a rich crown prince will make a much better movie. 
So, I can only say that when we can... Oh, now I think it's very relevant whether Christ came from the top or the bottom of the technology totem pole. I consider Christ a great architect, engineer, mathematician, doctor, philosopher, holy man who spoke three languages and was widely traveled. Somehow, I'm sure the hundred suitcases of gold when he turned 13 had to have been the reason he wasn't chained to daily toil. I can only say that when we reconsider his story as the adventures of the richest crown prince, even king in the region, rather than another laborer chafing at his sackles, the grand philanthropy of his sacrifice is even more epic. He was offered the kingdom if he bowed down to mammon, and he didn't, and ended up on a cross. Well, mission impossible with three guys. But what would be the grandest of all is if it turns out that J.C., with his Mission Impossible crew, managed to survive the crucifixion and escape to India, as several recent books out of India have argued. Holger Kirsten makes a great case for him beating the writ of execution by the Roman Empire and getting away with it. In his book, Jesus Lived in India, his unknown life before and after the crucifixion. ISBN 0 906 Element Books Limited, Long Mad, Shaftesbury, Dorset, England. I could not find one mistake in the whole book, so there was absolutely nothing I could disprove. All eminently probable hypotheses backed up with intriguing facts and conclusions. The story goes like this. Jesus, on his golden caravan, traveled the world and received much education in his travels. Upon his return, in opposition to the establishment, he was ordered executed by the Roman Empire. Joseph of Arimathea and the head Roman centurion were in on helping him escape. Jesus was drugged. The centurion inflicted a non-fatal slash, the length of the stab wound, and pronounced him dead so they didn't have to break his legs like the other two. When Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of the one, unlike the other two, the head centurion vouched Jesus was dead and Pilate acceded. I am still open to the possibility that Pilate was in on it too and has been much maligned wrongly. A Roman guard only fell asleep on duty once. The head centurion could have drugged his subordinates before leaving them at the tomb and later supported their plea for mercy or explanation to Pilate, and Pilate did not punish them. So again, there's an indication he might have been abetting Christ's escape from Roman justice with his head centurion and Joseph of Arimathea. Passing through so many nations on his way to India, how did they explain word of the guy who inherited 12,000 mules of gold but ended up on a Roman writ of execution so that the mission impossible was not put in peril and the Roman legions didn't give chase? Lots of possibilities there. So two or three men seem to have had the resources and the pull to have caused events to go either way. Pilate might have said might have said to throw the carcass to the dogs with the other two, though I bet they'd have had the resources to rescue him from there too. But Pilate's participation would have made the mission a cinch, though he would have needed an interesting explanation for all of the Jesus sightings. But he got away with it too. Let's face it, if the emperor said, hey, I keep hearing these reports about Jesus and your report said you execute him, he said, yeah, yeah, I executed him, but ask even the Jews and the Christians. They all say that he was resurrected. So they all tell you I killed him, but he came back to life. So I'm off the hook. And finally, the grandest move of all in the most epic Hollywood movie possible would have been suggested by Paul's statement that, quote, though he was rich with 4,000 tons of gold, he became poor for you. Could he have loaned it all, expecting nothing in return, to practice what he preached? Because he did say that. Lend your money, expecting nothing in return. Boy, could this dude have thrown some big parties. I applaud the grandest sacrifice in the Armageddon War for deliverance from the slavery of usurious debts. Jesus Christ, abolitionist of interest, debt fighter extraordinaire, my hero. I'm Johnny Engineer Thurmel, specialized in banking systems, saying Jesus Christ's suggestion, I approve. If you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Better you should give it to someone who can't pay you back.